Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his essay, Concrete Approaches to Investigating the Ontological Mystery, Gabriel Marcel will have a somewhat extended discussion of three closely related themes, despair, betrayal, and suicide. He talks about these and analyzes them in much greater depth in other works, but he's going to bring them up here in, in part to illustrate what he's, what he's calling the dramatic character of existence. He's also talking about them as human possibilities, possibilities that you might say are part of the existential condition for us at every point, but which can be exacerbated by all sorts of other factors, including the type of a world and culture and civilization that we live within. So he tells us that... Um, he says, perhaps some will be surprised to find such emotionally charged, fashionable words as suicide and betrayal in the midst of a calm and abstract analysis. Why are you talking about this sort of thing? And he says, well, this is no concession to sensationalism. I am firmly convinced it is in drama and through drama that metaphysical thought becomes conscious and defines itself concretely. And he brings up Jacques Maritain, another kind of existentialist figure. He was a representative of what we sometimes call existentialist Thomism. And um, Maritain, in his, his discussion about Christian philosophy, said, there's nothing easier for a philosophy than to be tragic. It need only yield to the weight of the human condition. And Marcel says he has Heidegger in mind with that, perhaps. But really, the, the big problem for us is to be not tragic because at least tragedy has some sort of meaning. And when we're talking about despair or we're talking about suicide, these are coming about in large part, not because there is some big tragic confluence in which a person can actually make sense of their life. Tragedy is still meaningful. And so Marcel says that... Um, I find, on the contrary, philosophy naturally inclines towards realms where the tragic dimension has simply, it, it, it simply disappeared, evaporated by its contact with abstract thought. And because people ignore the person and sacrifice it to I know what not ideal truth, to what anonymous principle of pure inwardness, they're unable to grasp the tragic dimensions of human life. They exile them to some disreputable suburb where a philosopher worthy of the name doesn't deign to go. And so Marcel says, we don't want to do philosophy in that way. We want to take these things seriously. And he, he says, if I have stressed despair, betrayal, and suicide, it is because, so he's telling us here the reason, the key, why it is that he's talking about this, we find in them the most obvious expressions of a will to negation brought to bear effectively on being. Now, there's a couple things that are important to point out here. One is he's not saying that these are the only manifestations of such a will to negation, right? He's just saying these are some rather obvious ones. And notice that it's a will to negation. It's not a automatic thought that must be followed to negation. There's a choice involved here, not a choice that one can, you know, simply make looking at all the options in front of oneself and say, oh, well, I'm not going to do negation. I'm going to do affirmation or something else. But it is still involving human responsibility. This, this is really an existentialist choice about where to commit oneself how to view the world, how to view oneself. 
So a will to negation that is applied to being. It's good if we think about the despair part first. I think that's the easiest way to get into this discussion. But I will mention one thing about suicide, which is that Marcel um, giving this talk in the 30s is saying something that other philosophers will come up with a little bit later. And that is that suicide is indeed a metaphysical question. He says, one could say that in this sense, the permanent possibility of suicide, the fact that at any given point, a person, however seemingly fortified they are, however filled with grace they might be, could at some point go in the other direction and go far enough to where they would actually attempt or even succeed in suicide, that is a, a constant possibility, not a probability, but a possibility. So he says the permanent possibility of suicide is an essential starting point for authentic metaphysical thought. Now, to come back to despair, what is despair? For a long time, despair has been understood as one of the many different human emotions. And Marcel thinks that it is an emotional state, but it also has some important cognitive aspects to it. It represents an attitude towards being and the entire range of beings. It is a metaphysical state as well as a moral state. So he talks about authentic despair or um, absolute despair as an act by which one despairs of reality as a whole. Obviously, there's other possibilities for despair. I miss the bus. I feel hopeless. I, I feel despairing because I'm not going to make it to the job interview. And without the job interview uh, in a tough economy, I'm not going to be able to get myself out of my little rat trap apartment and start moving on with my life. And it's one more damn thing in a succession of setbacks to myself. Right. That's that's not necessarily despair about the totality of existence, but it, it could easily fit into that, couldn't it? And it does for many people. So an act by which one despairs of reality as a whole. And Marcel devotes a little bit of analysis to here uh, to this here and, and tells us um, what that is, is like. He says despair announces itself as the consequence or the expression of a certain balance sheet. You're totaling up reality. Is it, is it good? Does it suck? That, you know, these are very contemporary terms, right? But you can easily relate them to what he's talking about. So he says, insofar as I can evaluate reality, and after all, what lies beyond my ability to appreciate is for me like something non-existent, I find nothing that withstands a process of dissolution that develops at the heart of things and which my reflection enables me to recognize and measure. Now that's a, a rather you know, philosophical way to talk about this, but let's, let's think our way through this. What he's saying is that when I look at everything, I don't see anything that has any intrinsic value or meaning to it. It's all capable of being looked at, thought about, reflected on, broken down into other component parts related to other, you know, far off ends. And none of it really, really matters by itself. There's nothing truly there from a moral or metaphysical perspective. And when you look around the world and each thing that you look at feels like that or presents itself like that, that is what despair can consist in. He has another great expression for this. These are economic terms. He says, there's nothing in being to which I can give credit, nothing I can count on, no security. And then he says, it's a declaration of complete insolvency. There's nothing that I can say, I can trust this. I know that I'm not seeing the whole of this, but I can actually trust it. And not in the sort of new agey kind of trust, like give positivity to the universe and the universe will give positivity to you. No, in the more mundane sort of, I actually know that this light is going to work or this chalkboard is going to work for me. 
or go on and on and on. I'll be able to wear this tie again. And you might say, well, how could you not trust that sort of thing? Well, you know, if you spend time thinking about the things that we surround ourselves with, they, they are kind of absurd quite often. It's surprising that things hang together. It's a kind of miracle that things aren't in a worse muddle than they are. And actually, Marcel says, you know, the great pessimists, although they're wrong about things, have actually done us some valuable service in showing us that things are not the wonderful Pollyannish or totally reliable bits of, you know, data. So the way they are sort of in a computer game, you know, you go and you pick up your gun and it works the way the algorithms have said. And you pick up the ammo for it. You pick up your food thing that replenishes your life, right? Uh, if you're in, in some video game, one bit of chicken is like another bit of chicken. But if you're in real life, the bit of chicken, if it's not cooked right, might actually give you food poisoning or salmonella or it doesn't taste the way it should, or when you're trying to cook it, it curls up on the edges. And, and there's always reasons why. And we could go on and on, and I, I don't want to get too far into that. But he talks about not only an objective status or side to this, but also looking at oneself. He talks about a non-coincidence between one's being and one's life. And he says that you can take a look at your life and at life in general, not, not only your life, but others' lives, and um, say that they're inadequate. And not just inadequate at the moment, you know, at this life stage, or before I graduate, or, you know, until I meet the ideal person, or anything like that, but inadequate for good. Another way people talk about this is that no matter what they are, no matter what they do, they will never be good enough. They will never be enough for themselves, for others, for the world, perhaps even for God. This is part of the attitude of despair as Marcel is sketching it out. And he tells us that despair can come in many different forms. It doesn't always have to be an absolute despair. It could be centered more on one thing than another. Um, and it comes with many degrees of intensity. We can have a sort of low-grade despair uh, churning away all the time in the background as part of the you know, soundtrack of our life, you might say. Marcel loved musical metaphors. So in this case, it would be something like a drone. Imagine some unpleasant sound that's always there. Marcel thinks that the act of despair has a relation to the functionalized world. Um, and he, he, he doesn't just think that it's you know, the case that this sort of world where we are reduced to functions can bring us to despair. He also thinks that because it's a world of problems and techniques or technology, however you want to translate that term, uh, that we, we reduce everything to, we sort of flatten out the world perspective, that we can, we can fall into despair through that. And we can do so even in moments, as he says, of technological optimism where we think that everything can be solved through coming up with one more technique, one more algorithm, one more platform, one more bit of technology. We can solve everything. He says that, um, here we go, um, it's easy to, to fall into a kind of despair because of the fact that we are the prey of our technics. We can't even realize how far out of control these things can, can get. And so those, those kind of balance each other off. We also, when we become aware that the tech, you know, the, the technical approach to things that we come to rely on so much that for some of us it becomes the only approach possible. Think about Silicon Valley people who believe that just by coming up with a new platform they will solve the world's problems or that the world's problems are in fact amenable to uh, that sort of treatment to begin with. Um, 
when we realize that that's not the case and we realize that we don't have the resources to face up to that, that doesn't just scare us. That can make us feel the opposite of hope, despair. So betrayal and suicide, as he says, are constant possibilities for us. What does he mean by betrayal? Betrayal of the ontological exigency or need within us that we find ourselves not always capable of articulating or understanding well, let alone responding to appropriately. And we find ourselves to some degree resourcelessness in a world that seems full of all sorts of shallow resources. This is closely connected with despair. Now, he tells us, and, and here he's hearkening back to earlier treatments of despair in earlier Christian thought, that despair has an opposite, and that opposite is indeed hope. He will devote a lot of discussion to hope. The last thing that we need to realize for Marcel is that within every situation where despair is a possibility or even an actuality, or if we go beyond that, where it's not merely an actuality, but it is the status quo. It is the situation that we are inevitably in. There is also the possibility of going outside or beyond this. He says, uh, there is a correlation between hope and absolute despair that remains until the very end. They appear to me to be inseparable. And he says, the world we live in, so centered on functions, facilitates and can even seem to recommend an absolute despair. But it's only in a situation such as this that invincible hope can arise. Here is where he credits the great pessimists of the past. And he even talks about Nietzsche as well. He says, these thinkers prepared us to understand that absolute despair might be what it was for Nietzsche on an infra-ontological level. And moreover, in an area strewn with mortal perils, the springboard launching point for the highest affirmation. So it is always possible to hope. Now, this isn't sort of counseling a buck up buddy, or always look on the bright side of life or anything like that, because that's not what Marcel means by hope. But hope is the correlate of despair. And every time that despair is going on, the great tragedy of it is that the person quite often, precisely because of that despair, can't see the hope that's lingering there as a possibility in the background. 